this is the dangerous session of the afternoon, right? When the, the lights are low and it's late in the afternoon. The good news is we've got a terrific panel. Uh, folks, uh, why don't you come out? Uh, we want to, we've got uh, a not much time, so I'm going to just introduce these folks very briefly. Uh, so, uh, lingering in the back, first of all, is Manisha Desai. Manisha is a professor of medicine uh, and biomedical data science. She founded the quantitative science unit uh, at Stanford, uh, 30 data scientists. Ha have a seat, please, folks. Um, and is leading the data coordinating center for the Apple Heart Study, which is what we're going to be talking about with this panel. So Marco Perez, next, is Associate Professor of Medicine, co-PI of the Apple Heart Study. Uh, he's a specialist in genetics and epidemiology, especially related to heart disease, led the studies of atrial fibrillation in the Women's Heart Initiative, and uh, is head of the Stanford Inherited Arrhythmia Clinic. And last, Mintu uh, Tarakia is Associate Professor, Executive Director of the Center for Digital Health here, uh, he's chief of cardiac electrophysiology uh, at the VA health system. He's been a PI of a number of trials uh, testing digital health tools. So we are going to leap in. Uh, we're going to leave 15 minutes for questions at the end, which means we're going to move pretty quickly uh, over the next half hour to frame what happened with the Apple Heart Study. And we're going to start out with a little bit of background about the, the clinical need and the technology. So, uh, Mintu, can you take us through that? Yes, thanks, Paul. Um, uh, thanks uh, to all of you for, for being here at the, this last hour. And so, the, one of the reasons we wanted to spend some time talking about the Apple Heart Study and getting feedback is this is a very interesting case of what you might be able to do with a wearable and an early use case of going from wellness or, or retail fitness, so to speak, into, into health. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat of uh, an irregular rhythm of the heart that can cause a variety of symptoms. Typically, patients have an irregular heart rate uh, that also tends to go fast. One of the key uh, outcomes that's uh, negative is a stroke. In fact, sometimes when people come to the hospital with a stroke is the first time you find out they have atrial fibrillation. And what's very interesting about atrial fibrillation is it can often go undiagnosed for long periods. We think there's about 700,000 people with AFib hmm. out there um, that are undiagnosed. And so a number of people have posited screening um, with traditional ECG measures, but now we have technology right on our wrist using a PPG sensor, a derivative of a pulse ox sensor uh, that's been used kind of in the medical world. And could you, you look at pulse irregularity from these waveforms to, to measure heart rate? And what would that look like? And so over the course of development, a number of companies have tried to take this on um, in healthcare and even outside in the wellness arena. And the idea with such a technology is, could you actually use some sort of signal processing or recognition to, to do this? And so what was developed on, on the Apple Watch by the maker of the Apple Watch is this idea that you can take a sequence of irregular pulses um, called tachygrams, and cl first classify that, get that right in terms of what it labels in, in looking and classifying AFib versus normal rhythm. And then can you create an algorithm that has a high level of precision to do this? Some of the earlier wearable algorithms were not so good at this. They had very high false positive rates and very low positive predictive values. And so here what was done is, well, let's take a different strategy and check and recheck and recheck again, and let's do this at a time when the watch is not going to um, create noise, when you're not moving, when you're still, when contact is good. And so Apple developed this algorithm um, looking at a notification cascade of, and if you had five out of six that met um, irregularity criteria, then it may be suggestive of AFib. And so this was the idea, this was the concept, this was the algorithm, and, and so we were now in a process of what do we do and how do we test it? And if I could add one thing, too, um, just for clarification, there, there are a lot of devices, including the newer Apple Watch, that have the EKG sensor, where you can just mm -hmm. put your finger on the little crown, and then you get an EKG, and that's very exciting. But we did not use that in this study. Um, this is just using the light sensor. The big difference is for the EKG, you have to actually take your finger and put your uh, put it on the crown. Whereas with this light sensor, it's just sitting in the background, intermittently checking, and if you have or not 
it doesn't matter if you have symptoms, if you, if you have an irregular, what it thinks is an irregular pulse, it'll then uh, alert you. So Manisha, uh, one of the uh, really interesting aspects of what you all did was the study design. So start us out with that. What, sure. what were the objectives, first of all? Sure. And then tell us about the design and what was unusual about the design. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly take you through the study design. I'll start with the with the overall the overarching goal, which was to evaluate the the app um, uh, for how well it detected um, atrial fibrillation. And, and really, we wanted to first know um, how many how many people would get notified. So what was the notification burden out in in the wild? That was really our, our first goal. We really had no idea what the notification burden was going to be. And then among those who were notified, we wanted to know if we were to put the gold standard ECG patch monitor on them and look at them subsequent to a notification, would atrial fibrillation be detected um, subsequent? subsequent to the notification. And then our a major goal was to look at simultaneous measurements, the simultaneous signal from the Apple Watch with the gold standard, the ECG patch, to look at the concordance between the, the signal from the, from the two devices. And in particular, we wanted to know um, the performance of the, the algorithm and uh, to estimate the positive predictive value. So that was really our goal. And so the design was, was really quite simple and pragmatic. We wanted to be as pragmatic as possible. This was a prospective single arm, low risk, open label study. And the reason we wanted to be pragmatic was because we wanted to engage as many participants as we, as we possibly could um, so that we could generalize um, the performance of, of the app. And so um, we uh, Kept, we did, did this in multiple ways, had these multiple pragmatic features, and one was by keeping the inclusion criteria really quite broad and the exclusion criteria quite, quite narrow. So essentially, if you were um, 22 years old um, or older, if you had an iPhone or an Apple Watch, you were in, as long as you didn't have a history of atrial fibrillation or you weren't currently using anticoagulants. And so um, you were able to enroll in the study, and you're able to do so in a virtual fashion by just um, going onto the, onto the app and enrolling and consenting through the app. So that was a, a nice pragmatic feature that allowed us to engage um, many more participants than uh, would normally uh, be possible in a traditional setting. And then if you were notified, you were asked to initiate, so this is where there was a little bit of burden on, on, the, on the user. Among those who were notified, you were asked to initiate um, a telehealth visit. So again, virtual use of virtual clinics made things easier for us to engage participants. You were asked to initiate a visit with the telehealth um, doctor, and then you were given the ECG patch to wear and to return back to us so that we could get the data and analyze it and then go over your results with you with another telehealth visit. Um, and then after this, um, 90 days after you were notified, you were asked to fill out a, a survey and then everyone in the study was asked to fill out an, an end of study survey. And now I'll let Marco uh, give us a sense of, of the findings, what, what we learned. Yeah, so, uh, so one of the really exciting things about this is that we, you know, when we, when we went into this, we there hadn't really been a study done quite like this, and, and we weren't sure what the participation was going to be, what the engagement was going to be, and we were blown away. I mean, we uh, within eight months, we had four, over 400,000 people, uh, which is a little uh, unprecedented. Um, and uh, if, you go, if you go to the next slide, the, um, the, the exciting thing, too, is that, that we didn't engage just sort of young, healthy people. I mean, these... Um, these people uh, did have a, did have a pretty wide distribution of of, uh, of disease, but um, even though most of the people that we engaged were were younger, which we kind of expected because this is sort of a, a study that's using technology, we still had a fair number of, of of older people, and you know AFib affects you know the older population more, and risk of stroke are higher if, if you're older. Um, and while only 6% were over the age of 25, that's still almost 25,000 people. So it's still, it's still pretty good numbers. If you go to the next slide. So, uh, and again, these were people, not just completely healthy people. I mean, these were people with all the risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and, and, and so on. If you go to the next slide. So, 
Um, so this was this was one of the most important things that 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 we found, which was that you know when we when we when we first started this, this algorithm had been developed in in, in you know in a, in, a, in a very controlled environment with people we knew had AFib and people who didn't, and and it was all all under very controlled conditions. We were releasing this into the wild. We had no idea how how this was going to behave uh, out in the in the real world, and we were very excited and, and we were very measured at the very beginning and in, in, in the numbers that we were enrolling, but. Um, we saw pretty quickly that the, the the numbers of people getting notifications were not not very very high, which is really good news because it means it meant that the algorithm was 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 at least not causing a lot of what we thought were going to be false positives. So the overall only 0.5 percent of people got a notification. It was much higher in the older people. Next slide. Um, the, there was a good relationship between those who subsequently got a notification on their watch and, and the um, atrial fibrillation on the patch, as, as Manisha talked about. And then, uh, and then when we looked at those who, ha who had atrial fibrillation, most of the episodes that we identified were long episodes. They weren't just little short bursts of, of AFib, which might not mean very much. So these were actually long, long episodes of atrial fibrillation. Um, so, um, so, you know, again, one of the... Very important things is that there were not a lot of positives that we were afraid gonna, were going to be un, you know, un, you know, not not clinical. So we were very excited with, uh, with with that with that result. And those who did have a patch monitor later uh, were found. 34% uh, of them had clinically diagnosed uh, atrial fibrillation on the patch monitor. Those who didn't have AFib on this patch monitor might have had episodes that were coming and going, so we might have missed some of those, um, but we still had a pretty reasonable yield of, of atrial fibrillation. And, and tell us more, again, it went by fast, the correlation between the patch and the watch. Talk, talk us through that again. Yeah, so if once, once you got a notification, as Manisha went through, you, you got a patch in the mail, and then we were still monitoring those people with their watch um, while they were wearing their patch, and if the watch then had another alert for uh, for atrial fibrillation, 84% of the time it was it correlated with or it was also associated mm -hmm. with an episode of atrial fibrillation. So uh, so if there was so not many people were getting a or, or, or notifications, but if you got a notification, there was a good chance that it was it was actually atrial fibrillation. And give us another uh, novel part of the study design was the the virtual doc connection. Uh, give us a little more flavor for how that worked. That, that was an experiment, as I understand it. Pretty much. Minty, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, so the, I, I guess the top line findings as a segue here is, is what did we do and, and how do we put all this together? And what you do see um, is we were end-to-end -end virtual. And so the interesting thing about this design, and we'll go over this, is there is no clinical research infrastructure for what we wanted to do. This is, the, this is not how you build a trial today for a drug or a compound or even a med device, and you've done a lot of those, Paul. So we were building this pop-up restaurant for a trial that was imminently scalable, and I think that's the one unique thing. When you build the trial infrastructure, it doesn't scale in the way tech does. So how do we do that? And the, one of the ways we did that was, one, you go end-to-end, -end, with the study. So if you want to enroll, you, you went to the app store, you downloaded the app, you did your onboarding and eligibility, and you signed the consent with your finger. A lot of studies do that now. But then once you were in and it said, hey, we've activated the software that's going to now look for an irregular rhythm, if it actually came up, the app would tell you the next part of the study is to go to this, to, to have a study visit. And you didn't have to walk to your nearest hospital or call Stanford Healthcare. You, you pressed a button and had a video visit with American Well, who is our telehealth partner. And so that brings up some of the operational complexities we've heard about yesterday, for example, medical licensing and things like that. But the other thing we wanted to do here is we wanted to guide and ensure safety, tell participants what this means and what the next study steps were, but also return information to them. So all these participants got their full study visit report as well as the results of the Holter to take to the doctor. We didn't prescribe therapies as part of the study, but it would empower these people to do that. And so now you have to train a group of telehealth specialists to do a clinical study who are, by and large, primary care family practice and internal medicine to do the things that Marco and I love to do, which is take care of AFib patients. And so at every step, we were building along the way, and I think one of the key takeaways is it can be done. 
Yeah, and you know, through this whole process, um, again, we, we went into this without a template on how to do this. And, and uh, one of the things we just didn't know was uh, study participation. So how, how engaged people were going to be when they got a notification. Um, so we, we had no idea uh, how many people were actually going to call a telehealth provider. Um, so we learned, you know, by doing this study is that, you know, everybody who got notified, only 50% of them, you know, only half of them uh, ended up calling a study health provider. And so as we were doing this, we were, we were thinking through and we were able to implement some of this during the study, but I think we, we had a lot of challenges. Um, and we were thinking about ways of, okay, how could we engage these participants more? What, you know, could we give them different types of notifications, remind them more frequently? Should we have implemented a, a, phone, a way of phone contacting them earlier? Yeah. And, and Manisha, you remember, we, we had these conversations. Yeah, and all of these things had sort of implications for the, the, da the data that came downstream. I think the more pragmatic we were, it sort of, you know, we tried to shift the focus and shift the burden off of the participants so that they would engage and they would en enroll. And when you shift the burden off of the participant, the burden then becomes on, comes onto the study team. And in this case, a lot of the burden was on um, the, the study team and the data scientists, because when you're passively collecting data on, on participants, the data get noisy. Mm. And um, the, the the so there's measurement error issues. There's issues with missing data. You know, I think Bintu alluded to the how the the technology works and, and the sampling uh, frequency of the watch. So um, the the sampling frequency increases if there's something interesting going on. And so there's differential sort of contribution of of data that comes in um, for for different people. And that's that's one of the features of a pragmatic design is that when you're not actively um, collecting data, you have data issues. And so a lot of that burden comes on to the, to the study team and off of the participant. But there was some burden on the participants yeah. as well. At least those who were notified, they were asked to initiate a telehealth visit. And we, only, we saw a, a, that there was some fallout there. Um, so, the, so when we did put the burden on the participant, we, we had to expect there was going to be missing data. And these were things that we fully anticipated and we thought about and we had to incorporate in the, in the design, um, right up front in the, in the design considerations. We had to think about, you know, what variables should we make sure to, to collect and to think about that could mitigate some of, the, some of the issues that could come into play if we did have this kind of fallout. So a lot of these issues we had talked about beforehand and anticipated. And what was nice about this study is it was almost uh, the ideal situation to, to test uh, um, around the central question, right? So the, the main objective is, you know, does this work? Is it safe? And, and by the way, how many people are going to get notified if you unload this? Because that's the one thing clinicians uh, had had the most anxiety, if not resentment about, and yeah. that's still a hot yeah. button topic. But let's, let's go beyond that and let's just crank up on, a, on, on the spectrum of like explanatory trials, so the sort of pa simple patient enrollment, study visit coordinator, paper consent, all the way to fully pragmatic. I think we were dialed up quite high. Yeah. And, and there's no reference for that. There's no reference on what, you know, should the right engagement be. Clearly we want 100%, but is, you know, if... 44% of the people having their first study visit, is that success, is that failure? Well, we think it's success as, as the first time to do this. But there's so much to learn in optimizing the user experience, making it more sticky, doing even more than we did, and, and thinking of how we get people to engage. Because in some ways, if you techify healthcare and you let people be on their own, it's going to be even lower than a sample of people willing to participate. So, so this so gives you must, have, you must have brainstormed about this a little bit. So, so what ideas d do you have? Just in, and we'll, we'll get the audience involved with some ideas in, in a few minutes. But what have you thought about? So, for, for example, for that, that uh, half of the patient population that didn't reach out to a virtual provider, is, is there something to do about that? I think, well, so the first thing I'll say is you want to keep some core principles no matter how you do a trial. Mm -hmm. And the core principles are participant safety, privacy, and security. They're giving you the data, and, and for the reasons we heard Shez and everyone the last two days talk about, you got to keep those. And then the question is how, how much more do you then start nudging them to, to do things? And, and you know, I'm going to let Marco and Manisha yeah. weigh in because mm -hmm. we did take on some of this yeah. mid-trial. 
Yeah, we, we did. So when we saw that our, for example, our, our that the people calling in weren't, you know, the percentage of people calling in was wasn't as high as we wanted it uh, to be. Uh, we we bring we did brainstorm. We we, we thought about okay, can we um, can we change the messaging? You know, when when mm. people were notified, because there was this balance. You know, we wanted to. We didn't want to scare people to think that, you know, because of this notification, they were an imminent uh, emergency, em emergency. But, uh, but we wanted to, to, to convince them that they, it was important enough that they, they, they should call. And so thinking about how to message them, uh, what language to use. So that was one thing. Um, also, you know, we had phone numbers and we had email uh, on these participants. Mm -hmm. but there's, again, a balance between, you know, overdoing it with, you know, we didn't want to call them and annoy them. Exactly. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to engage them. And we had to think think too from an analysis perspective, you know, what, what do we do about, about this? Um, and so we had to think about, you know, well, what variables could be related to not initiating a visit? And what can we put into, into our design? What data can we collect to make sure that we can mitigate some of these issues? And so, you know, if, if we show, I think it's on uh, the, the slide, um, after after this one into the uh, with the baseline demographics, so you know one thing we 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 made sure to do was to compare um, all the observed variables between those who were notified and excluded from the analysis and those who were notified and included to make sure that there was they were comparable. Now at the end of the day, the the data are missing, um, and so we don't know necessarily, and so we d we have to anticipate and think about what what variables could be associated with missingness. You know maybe. Um, participants who are quite symptomatic and, and have high atrial fibrillation burden, for example, are running to their cardiologist and they don't want to bother with the study. And so um, what can we do about that? And so we made sure to capture information on atrial fibrillation burden among those who we did get data from so that we could look to see um, how much the positive predictive val value varies by such a variable. And so we just had to be very mindful um, of, of looking at features like this to see um, the sensitivity of our findings. That was, that was one thing that we made sure to do up front. The, the other thing that we did, again, going fully pragmatic, is this is not linked to any EHR healthcare data. This is not, there's no API in the back that says connect to your medical record. So we had to take on face value that they said that they didn't have a history of AFib and the medical history they gave up front. Now we actually rechecked the medical history at some of the study visits if they called to, to verify consistency and exclusions. But again, that adds to the, the richness, but the messiness of the data. And again, trying to assess like what happens if you just let this out? Maybe a whole bunch of people with AFib want to sign up because yeah. they're so excited. And so you have to plan for that as well. Manisha, you mentioned uh, that, that there was some messiness in the data, that that's important. But, but doesn't the large data set sort of overwhelm that? Uh, you know, I, think, um, I think there's this sense that when the data are big, mm -hmm. when you have high volumes of data, the signal's going to come through. And you're going to get the answer that you're, you're going to find the answer um, that you're that you're posing, and and that that really is not the case. I think um, you know issues with measurement error, issues with missing data, can really introduce bias into your into your findings. And even even if you have large amounts of, of data, it, that's true. You know, for example, here we're we're we were very interested in the positive predictive value, right? So that meant lining up the um, signal from the Apple Watch and having it perfectly aligned with the gold standard data. And so we had to match, we had to line on time. And so, we, you know, time oh. is a noisy variable that's, that's coming in. And so we had to be very thoughtful. You know, you can imagine if you're, if you're misaligned, you're going to get a biased viewpoint of what the positive predictive value is, even if you've got lots, of, lots and lots of these of data points. And so we had to be very careful um, to think about how do we measure these aspects so that we're confident so that there's, you know, to minimize the uncertainty that we have in a, a noisy variable like time. So, you know, one example is with the... Um, with the gold standard, as the, the battery gets, gets, starts to get depleted, the measurement of time gets noisier and noisier. Mm. So we had to think about, you know, yeah. we're, let's restrict the analysis to um, windows where, where we're getting the e-patches returned within a certain window so that we can have good confidence um, in, in the data. So, so again, a, a lot of the, the, the issues with the data integrity, one has to think about if, if one wants to answer this question, even with lots of, so, lots so of, lots of data. That's interesting. Do you expect that the, the time factor was a major reason in the... Uh, 
uh, not perfect correlation between the two? What, what, uh, how important was that, and what were the other factors? So there were there were a number of um, there there was a num number of variables with respect to time that we actually did look at. So one of the issues. Uh, we thought about was, you know, if if someone puts on the, the gold standard, um, if, if they hook up the gold standard very quickly after they're experiencing symptoms, we might be more likely to, um, to, to detect atrial fibrillation than if they took a longer time. And so issues with, with time were, were very important here. And so we made sure to, to capture those features and to look at our positive predictive value. And we actually did not see that, that as much variation across positive predictive value. It was a pretty stable um, answer across the board. So we looked at the length of time that you were wearing it. We looked at the, the time from onset of, onset of symptoms to hookup time, and we didn't see much, much variation. Yeah. So. And, and you know, to address part of your question, um, there are other things that can cause irregular pulse. Because remember, this is not EKG-based. This is just mm -hmm. based on blood flow. Uh, which is, you know, reflecting your pulse. And so, uh, especially this is, we think, especially true as you get older, there are other reasons why you might have an irregular pulse. You might have, you know, premature beats from the top or the bottom of the heart, and those can get more frequent as you get older. So there were other reasons, um, but they were probably still legitimately, truly irregular pulses. It was just for non atrial fibrillation reasons. Yeah. The, the one thing, we talked about the bigness of data, but the one thing we also learned that doesn't scale so easily is exception processing, okay? So, so you have everything going through a data stream, but what is the one thing in clinical trials and research that has exception processing built in? It's safety. Mm -hmm. Right? So anyone can call at any time and say, I have this. And we, look, we, this, is, this comes out based on census data to one out of 650 US adults enrolling. And so you have to have the backstop operation to manage a safety desk and that and people can call at any time. And what if they call us versus Amwell versus Apple? And, and so really streamlining that was something that we spent a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. Because that, that, as much as you do big and scale and it's end-to-end -end virtual, we got to remember that these are participants and, and a notification, while we think, while it's low risk, it's classified as a, as a minimal risk device, we have to watch that. And so if you take on trials and you decide to go big, really think about how, what your safety plan is going to be. So uh, for the audience, start thinking about questions. Uh, we'll get to it in just a minute. I, I, um, I'm curious to think, so, so are we uh, going to see uh, these algorithms uh, improving based on this kind of data? What, what, what room is left yeah. for improvement in the algorithm versus the, there's always going to be this messiness? There's certainly room for improvement, and there's, there's no question. You know, we, when we started this and we started thinking about the algorithm and how it should work, we we had safety and I mean at, in the forefront, right? And uh, and then this other idea that we've 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 touched on, which is this concern about this false positive um, mm -hmm. uh, rate. So uh, the the concern that every clinician had has when they he first hear that 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 this study was happening. Um, was that, oh, oh no, there's gonna be all these false positives, people are gonna be knocking on my, on my door at night telling me that their, their watch just alerted them. Um, so, so there's, um, the way that we designed this algorithm was to be as specific as possible so, so that the false positive rate would be, now we didn't measure the false positive rate in this, but that had already been done by, by the Apple team. Um, I think a lot of this too, and we haven't touched on this that much, is, is that with all these technologies um, has to come a lot of education. So a lot of the clinicians and cardiologists and uh, healthcare providers uh, have to start understanding these different technologies, um, have to start understanding the algorithms. For example, Apple has several notification algorithms. We, we've been talking about the atrial fibrillation notification algorithm, but they also have a tachycardia algorithm. If your heart goes too fast, you'll get notified. If your heart goes too slow, you'll get notified. And so to understand what that means and how good each of these notifications is, is going to be important. And this study, I think, very importantly, helps us at least understand the AFib notification better. Well, please come up to a mic if you have uh, questions. I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going to go off script and ask you something uh, th that we didn't talk about. But I'm, I'm curious about your vision for how the technology gets used ultimately. Right? H how is this going to play out? 
So it's, uh, there's so many ways to go in that direction. And I think that what's exciting is the stuff is here. The train has left the station. We as clinicians need to understand how we're going to use it. And this has been the focus of a lot of discussion and debate. But actually, very recently at the Heart Rhythm Society meeting a couple weeks ago, um, discussion about giving patients their data. But um, the, the other, um, th th there's several areas. One is just diagnosing the undiagnosed. And we've heard about ambient sensors all over to do that. And the, so there's one philosophy there, or, or one approach here. The other is disease management and using this as a product to manage AFib. We actually haven't figured out how we should do that. AliveCore, there are other companies who are doing that. And so the use case, the test characteristics, sensitivity, specificity will change as they go. And then look, in the middle of the study, the ECG comes out on the next version. So the technology is, even though we enrolled 400,000 people in eight months, it's not fast enough to keep up with the technology. And so I think that's the interesting thing that we have to stay ahead of. Yeah, I think there's also other interesting um, implications to this that need to be studied, which is, you know, the, the fact that participants and patients are constantly getting informed um, of, as yeah. to what's happening and what the downstream implications of that are, are going to be, I think, is going to be interesting to study. It's also going to change the way we, um, we think about and we monitor, we monitor trials for, for safety, for example. Um, I think the, there's going to be a lot more focus um, on the data science and the data integrity, but also we're going to think about safety in a different way than we, than we traditionally do. And you know, be it Apple or other companies, I mean, I think the way this technology is moving is that we're, go we're getting into this era where we're all being monitored constantly all the time. And, and so I think we have to take data that we get from studies like this and, and to, to start to understand what that means. And clinically, you know, there's a lot to do to, to help us understand the clinical consequences of, of the things that we've found. And, and I think that's just going to take time. Right. Well, let's start front microphone, please. Hey, okay. Ala Yusuf, University of Toronto. Um, I have two interesting questions. The first one was the 50% group that uh, did not get notification or, or got notification that did not uh, give back a call. Uh, was there any something interesting about their demographics in terms of age groups or in terms of their characteristics? So later on, interventions could be delivered and targeted at these groups uh, through patient education health coaching. The second question is, um, would this be something you envision being more of disease management in primary care where there's more of health coaching, family doctor, consistently reviewing uh, results and integrating this into patient profile and then sending or referring them, referring patient to cardiologist when there is really a need and urgency. How likely do you think this is going to roll out? So I'll take the first question, which is um, comparing those who actually initiated a visit um, versus those who didn't. And we did look pretty closely at, at uh, the, the demographics and other observed variables, and we didn't really see um, large differences qualitatively. Um, that doesn't mean they're, they don't exist because the data are, are missing. However, it, it gives a pretty good indication that on the data that we had, we were extrapolating to the population that we, that we wanted to. So that was good news. Um, it's still, we still went forward and did a number of sensitivity analyses to anticipate what those different, what possible differences uh, there were that we didn't possibly see. Um, so it, it sort of informed some sensitivity analyses, but we didn't actually see um, large differences demographically. And to the clinicians for the second? Yeah, I, you know, I think to get at the, the second question, um, and again, this is just the beginning. I mean, this study was really designed to understand what's happening, um, what kind of people get notified, what happens when you put a patch monitor on. To get it at the, at the, you know, what should we do? How, what should we implement at a population level? You know, should we make guideline recommendations about what to do when somebody comes with, in with a notification? I think that kind of thing we, we need to study a little bit more, and in, 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 it'll take a different study design. But you're right. I think I think eventually we need that. We need to do those studies that, that validate some of these approaches. You know, it might be that eventually we'll have a very clear algorithm for, for, for a doctor who's in the office and has somebody come in, you know, you should get a patch monitor X number of days, you know, within X number of days, and, and this is what you should do if you see atrial fibrillation. Again, that's not what we intended to do here, but that is, those, those are the next steps. I think there's somebody at back, Mike. I'm blinded by the lights, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Akash. I'm a pediatric genetics resident at Stanford. 
Uh, thank you so much for talking about this study. I think it's really um, exciting to hear about not only the scale, but also the design of your approach. For those of us interested in doing something like this, who should we have on our team? What resources should we turn to that are enabled here at Stanford um, to try to, some, to start something like this? So I'd like to, to start with that, and then I'll, I'll um, turn to my colleagues. But um, data scientists. <laughs> um, so it, it, with, this, with this type of design, we're, we're trying to implement multiple types of pragmatic features, um, and maybe even engaging vendors who aren't necessarily set up to do research and have, have with structured fields, um, like, like we're typically used to doing in a clinical trial setting, you really need a strong team of data scientists at the ready. And I, I can tell you, at the end of the day, this study was very simple from a statistical point of view. We presented proportions. We presented a positive predictive value. I didn't even do a regression. So, but they're, they're, the data science part of the study was, was quite intensive. Um, there were multiple diverse streams of data coming in. We had to link pieces of information across participants um, when interesting things were going on. For example, you know, when you're dealing with an app, um, someone might delete the app and then um, upload a new one and then re-enroll in the study. Um, so things like this can, can come up. And so you need a team of data scientists who are looking out for these issues and troubleshooting on an ongoing basis. So I think that's an important piece of it in terms of um, how to staff for something like this. The burden is going to be when you take the burden off the user and off the participant, it goes on the study team. And these types of studies are quite data intensive when you're passively collecting data like this. Um, so I, 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 would, I would say that that's really important. The other thing that's really important for this, and we did this to some extent, to a large extent in, in the study, is um, we did end-to-end -end testing um, to anticipate what kind of data flow issues we might have. I would suggest an even longer period of time for like a small pilot um, where you do um, a longer sort of end-to-end -end testing of the data flow and actually go through an exercise of, of analyzing the data to see um, what, what issues arise because there will be issues that arise that, that surprise you and that you can, and that you mitigate. So I think having a pilot um, for like, a month-long period would be an important way to go. So, so it's a great question for, for anyone at Stanford and beyond. I mean, first of all, just come talk to us. But you need engineers, you need, you need data scientists, quantitative science, statisticians, design experts, all that. In terms of the hard resources available, there's a few. So um, many of the clinical st study site-based infrastructure is through the Stanford Center for Clinical Research that has a table outside, led by Ken Mahaffey, who was also an extraordinary part of the study as its study chair. The quantitative sciences unit that Manisha described that she leads. We also have a very strong research IT group here, led by Todd Ferris and their group, and Michael Halas in the dean's office works on that. Um, I direct my team at the Center for Digital Health, puts on workshops, programs, and we try to kind of cut deals, as, as does IRT, with software providers to kind of bring this on for low cost. Because when you're starting your own thing, the, the problem is those early upfront pop-up restaurant costs are really high. And so what we want to do is not have you build that restaurant, just use the pieces in place and try to do it more quickly and inexpensively. And just to follow up a little bit more with what, what Mintu said, this was um, such a huge example of team science. I, I, Mintu mentioned a all the groups that, that were involved, and this study could not have been done with so all, of these, yeah. all of these teams and, and beyond that really helped, <clears throat> helped this put this together. We really needed all of those levels of, of expertise. So this was um, a really great example of team science in practice. Great. We have a couple more questions to the left here. Yeah, Ingo Beindlich, uh, Cedar Healthcare here in Palo Alto. Um, thank you for um, talking about the safety desk that you put in there. And I was just wondering about the difference of a classical clinical trial versus this virtual observational trial and what that has to do with the reporting requirements. Um, in a classical clinical trial, you're, you're required to report the uh, serious adverse events. So did you report the number of suicides and car accidents and broken legs? So, uh, well, it? so, so it, there's, there's several issues there. So, so just because it's virtual doesn't change the rules for safety. 
you have adverse device events, unanticipated events, anticipated events, unreal, device unrelated adverse events, all the stuff that, Paul, you've, you've done and teach at Biodesign. And so the regulatory framework for a low-risk device, this, again, this was um, an investigational device, this was an IDE study, um, is really no different. And so the key is to put those systems in place, pre-specify, and have consensus on what is unreal, you, know, you consider an ADE device, adverse device event, unrelated event, and make sure that the flow of information, most importantly, comes through, right? Because we have, end, we have a 90-day and an end-of-study survey to ask, but we also have to make sure that the information that comes via intake uh, comes to us as well. And so a lot of things, uh, you know, the, the, the two main concerns that could be related to the device is a rash from the watch, because you're wearing something that holds the algorithm, and then the anxiety of knowing that something's monitoring you, or the anxiety of getting a notification. And so all of that was planned for. And, and we did have a data safety monitoring board. Mm -hmm. We had yeah. an adverse... But with 400,000 yeah. participants, this can be huge, I mean, to, to, to yeah. all this. It is, and so you want to make sure that your plan is, is robust, and it's going to depend on the risk classification, whether you need to individually interview all of those 419,000 people or not, based on the risk. It's a great question. And next. Oh, hi, Ann Kopsil here at Stanford in the Office of Technology Licensing. Um, I think I saw in that that after they got a notification, 44% called the telehealth, and then it looked like they could be sent to the emergency room. What percentage went there, and were those um, true positives or false positives? Yeah, so we had uh, we had about 20 or so that ended up uh, uh, having to go to the to the emergency room. We um, we had limited follow up. Uh, we we uh, we did not send them because we we didn't want we wanted to just send them to the emergency room and have them sort of taken. So we didn't we didn't go through the full study visit and send them a patch and, and so forth. So we don't we don't have that piece of data for those participants. Uh, we did some follow up, uh, but not not. I mean, it was it was it was more difficult to to sort of get data from from uh, from, from from that group. I see. But do you have a sense if it was like people are are out there going, oh my gosh, thank goodness. I, I went early, or the emergency room people over there, oh, another Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> no. We, we were very good about training and retraining the clinicians. And remember, we have to give them credit. The study doctors, it was like, here you go. You're going to be the AFib doctor by phone and video, by the way. And so, um, but, but clear protocol-driven criteria, a script that they follow through, and if certain conditions are met, or of course at clinical discretion, they would go. So it wasn't the situation where just from clinical inexperience, you start sending people to the ER. Thanks. Right. Do you have a question? Yes. Hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm a nurse here at Stanford. And I think this is a great way to educate and engage patients. Um, but reflecting on the theme of inclusion for this conference and the fact that you're using telehealth, which is a great way to reach underserved populations, have you thought of how to reach the broader population or is the solution convince insurance companies <laughs> that they need to buy watches? Or? Yeah, that, you know, that, that's such an important question. And you know, we think about this a, a lot. And you know, one criticism that's come up is you know, you're, you're doing this study in people who have Apple Watches. I mean, this is, this is a very select group. and um, I, I think the reality, though, is is that um, these technologies are everywhere. Um, they are getting. I mean, the, the the percentage of the penetrance of smartphones is is already pretty high, even in the uh, underserved, and and other technologies like smartwatches are, are going to get there. And so, you know, I I think that I think that you're right that. Um, these 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 methods of recruiting participants, you know, they don't require somebody to have access to healthcare. You know, somebody with a smartphone, um, you know, maybe the right sensor on the right device, uh, will then be able to just participate, um, download an app, and that's really what happened here. You can just download an app, and you're in a study. And um, and I think eventually, as the penetrance of these devices get broader and broader we're going to see more participation for and, and as you can see from the the demographics we, we did have a pretty comparable distribution of, of the different underrepresented groups so mm -hmm. to, to the US population so African Americans Hispanics Asians and so forth um, so I, I think I think ultimately this will be a 
democratizing way of including more people. And we, you, we, saw, we had this great tech toys panel today, right? So, you know, it may not be the wearable. It may be the camera that looks at all of us right now and can look at phase detection of blood flow on your faces if you're still and say these people have a regular you know, perfusion of their face. It could be your bathroom towels. You brush your teeth and you have a left leg, right leg ECG every time you brush your teeth. It's like, hey, you might be an AFib, right? So uh, th this gives us a footprint on how to study many sensing technologies, however, whatever their modality is. That was a great question to end on, actually. So uh, thanks for the questions and please join. What an exciting study. You, you guys uh, in a massive amount of work. So please join me in thanking them for a great presentation.